welcome to the Ontario Caregiver Organization and Schizophrenia Society of Ontario webinar. Today's webinar topic is on the caregiver's journey and caring for someone with a mental health illness. I am pleased to introduce our speakers for today. Please note that our lineup has slightly changed as one of our speakers, Candace Christensen McAllister, has been rescheduled to support the current COVID-19 situation at her place of work. Please welcome Shane Christensen, who has recently completed his memoir, Kicking the Darkness, detailing his experience with mental illness. The book chronicles personal tragedy and triumph over adversity. Shane's perspective on mental illness and schizophrenia is based on a lifetime of experiences with close family members, with his brother being affected by mental illness and Shane's son having been diagnosed with schizophrenia as a young adult. Shane's son has been in recovery and is a talented songwriter and guitarist who has produced two CDs. In light of the current COVID-19 situation, Shane is giving away his Audible book online where it can be found at www.youtube.com and www.kickingthedarkness.com. We also welcome Sam Miller, who is a registered psychotherapist and current consultant with over 25 years of experience. He brings particular expertise in trauma counseling and mental health advising. Sam serves on a number of trauma response teams with a particular interest in post-traumatic stress, resilience, and wellness. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I would like to start with my story, which actually takes place in two different generations. It, initially, my brother, when he was 13 years old, in 1973, started to exhibit symptoms of serious mental illness, and that plagued him for the remainder of his life. He lived until he was 31 years old, and unfortunately, it ended up in his eventual suicide. And a big part of the reason for that was that in the 1970s, the stigma was uh, literally tenfold of what it what it would be today my parents never had him medically assessed he never received any medical or mental health treatment of any kind and uh, that was something that always stuck with me uh, not only when i was a child but uh, even to this day uh, the felt that i felt had the feeling that he was almost abandoned and wasn't given the treatment he needed. And then when you fast forward, um, it was about 10 years after his death that my son was about 17 years old, and my wife and I started to notice changes in him. And some of these changes were physical, and others were behavioral, and sometimes they were subtle, and other times they were serious enough uh, we highly suspected that he had a serious mental illness. And in, in hindsight, when I look at uh, his situation and compared to my brothers, they both had a, it was a progressive slide into mental illness. And in, in my son's case, it began with him sprinkling spices around the house. And that happened on a number of occasions. And then we would smell bleach. So he was doing things with bleach. And these were things that he had never done before. And then there was an escalation when after about a month, we were woken up late in the evening and we found that he had begun hanging tin foil from his bedroom ceiling. And when we asked him why he was doing that, he went into a basically a paranoid rant that he felt the FBI was spying on him, the CIA was trying to read his mind. So at that time, we knew something was definitely going, going on and it was serious. And because of my brother's situation where he didn't get the help he needed, my wife and I came to the conclusion that we had to do something immediate and drastic and that by simply delaying or denying it, 
was not going to help our son. The issue we face that I would never have imagined was that not only did my son lack the insight into his illness, and he was in denial, but he was also aggressively opposed to receiving any medical assistance at all. And that ended up becoming probably the most difficult thing that we encountered. That because he, you know, if he would have had a physical ailment, if he broke his arm, or he had any physical sickness, we wouldn't have experienced that aggressive opposition to getting medical treatment. And that just made everything so much more difficult uh, because he wasn't willing and able to go for treatment. Did you want to add to that, Sam? Thank you, Shane, uh, and thank you for sharing your story with us. Um, what I'd like to talk in the, about now is some of the points you made, but talk about, first and foremost, caregiver and caregiver stress, and maybe throughout our presentation today, we will also talk about the specifics of caregiver stress um, related to caring for someone who has a mental illness, as well as some of the concerns and issues you talked about with respect to stigma and the stigma associated with mental health. So from a caregiver perspective, you know, the demands of caregiving are exhausting, they're overwhelming, and especially if you feel you're in over your head um, or you have little control over the situation. Now, Shane, in your particular situation, you might have been a bit ahead of the curve from other individuals because A, you had the experience uh, of, of your brother's mental illness, uh, and B, uh, much to your credit and your wife's credit, you had the foresight to connect that to the situation that was happening with your son. But just in terms of general caregiver stress, um, caregivers by nature are individuals who want to give and who want to help. Um, and then when we're faced with the range of emotions that are involved in being a caregiver, it can become overwhelming. Emotions of, of guilt, did I do something wrong? Grief, what am I losing? Uh, sadness, depression, anger, um, fear, stress, speculation. That's from within, and then you add to that all of the emotions that you are, are dealing with with respect to individuals who are not in your situation, who don't understand necessarily what you're going through. Why do we have such a range of emotions? Because as parents, we want to help. As caregivers, we want to make a difference. And you pointed out something very interesting, Shane, Shane which was uh, your son didn't want to accept the help didn't acknowledge his illness. That was one of the challenges um, that, that we often face as caregivers. Another challenge of caregiving is sometimes the relationship that you enjoyed up until that point is a relationship that's now changed. Um, the individual you're de dealing with is changing. It's not the indiv individual you imagined. It's not the scenario that you, you possibly dreamed of in terms of moving forward. Um, and as well, um, the guilt and the worry of, of being a caregiver often involves the balance, the balance game, which is how much of my time and my strength and my emotional and physical and cognitive energy am I going to give to this person who obviously needs me and how much do I reserve for myself? And it's a balancing act of I need to give all to them versus taking care of myself. So that's a challenge, right? It's a challenge on, on on understanding, in this particular case, the illness, um, understanding the emotions and the range of those emotions that are going to be involved, um, and, and being able to take a step back, look at things in perspective, understand that you can't solve all the problems at once, though I'm sure, Shane, that was that initial response of how can I fix this, and how can I fix this quickly, and how can I make this individual better. And with respect to what you had said in terms of breaking the arm, right, that's the whole issue of, of understanding the stigma. We, for most of us, um, when we talk about illness and caregiving, we're doing that from what we call the medical model. I break my arm, I have some kind of medical illness, I go to a doctor, we diagnose, and we treat. 
it's not the same with mental illness. Absolutely. Nor, nor from our understanding of that perspective, uh, from the individual who's ill's perspective, and from family and friends who are trying to understand the situation. So, so again, a lot of what you've said is, is so true and so relevant to the, the issues that caregivers have in general and specifically to those who are, are caregiving uh, individuals with mental illness. Um, and I just want to talk for a moment a little bit about stress and burnout. What we'll talk a little bit later on is how do you do that balancing act? How do you protect yourself and your own mental health and emotional health and physical health with being that caregiver that you really um, want to be and can be um, because you're going to be the best advocate for your child. Okay, so those are, uh, again, thank you for what you shared um, and hopefully those points kind of bring it into focus. Absolutely, Sam. Uh, I like the fact that you had mentioned caregiver guilt because in my situation, it was really easy for me to get overwhelmed with a lot of things. And one was the guilt in that I had witnessed my brother's situation. And, you know, my wife and I got married. We wanted to have kids right away. And then we did. We ended up having three uh, kids within a six year period. And not once do you ever consider your DNA or, or what you're giving your kids through that. It was only after my son's situation where, again, it's easy to get into a negative mindset. And I had a lot of guilt. I was questioning myself. I felt that I was selfish for having kids and that because of that selfishness, a person that I loved uh, as much as life itself was going through a situation that no parent wants their child to go through. So it was a really difficult thing for me to accept. And then over time, speaking with a lot of uh, psychiatrists and mental health professionals, uh, my wife and I had uh, a lot of support. We uh, took advantage of a couple of parenting groups. And so that way you were exposed to what other parents were going through. And there was a consistency in that we all felt guilty. And it wasn't just me having my brother's situation. Every parent who was there, and it, a lot of it's because we love our kids so much, and once they get ill, you tend to blame yourself. What you find out over a period of time is that that is a waste of energy. You don't want to get into that negative headspace because it's just counterproductive. It doesn't help the situation at all. And that's one thing I would really stress through my life experiences is you have to block out any type of negativity you always have to look for the positive. And eventually I was able to do that. So that over a period of time, I didn't have that guilt. I resigned myself to the fact that there's a lot of reasons, a lot of causes for psychosis and schizophrenia. In my son's case, we knew that he had been using marijuana and other drugs. And, uh, you know, the, the medical proof, the science is uh, pretty valid that there is a probably a 10% of the population that could have a genetic predisposition that if they use cannabis or other drugs, that they could be prone to either psychosis or eventually schizophrenia. And over time, when I started seeing this, you know, the actual scientific data, it helped to alleviate a lot of guilt that I had gone through. And it just enforces your belief that sometimes in life, you know, whether it's schizophrenia, in, in my case, uh, when I was 55 years old, I had a heart attack. And I was the type of person that had exercised for 30 years. I ate right. One of the reasons why I did exercise and live that healthy lifestyle 
and you had alluded to this earlier, and we'll discuss it in more detail. I also recognize that in order for me to be a good caregiver for my son, I had to be strong, healthy, and that was the only way I was going to absorb the stress that we were going through because of my son. So I ate right, I exercised, I always looked to get seven hours of sleep a night. Sleep was one of the biggest ways, and that's something I, and I understand how a lot of people, even with what we're going through today, it's difficult to get sleep at times, but you really have to do everything in your power. If that means reducing caffeine intake or alcohol, whatever you have to do, go for walks because sleep is so important as a means of maintaining your own health and mental health. And that's what we incorporated as we dealt with my son's situation because our journey lasted years. So it wasn't days, weeks, it was literally years. And it never ends. So even though my son is stable now, with schizophrenia, there's never what you would call a medical recovery. He, like myself in my situation, as someone who's had a heart attack, I have to take medication for the rest of my life. My son has to take medication for the rest of her, his life. And um, so it's you, you do recover somewhat, but it's more of a medical stability in his case. And um, ironically enough, my medical situation helped him to accept that. And that helped him in his stability because now for the last three years, he's been taking his medication and we haven't had any issues with that. And like myself, the medication is pivotal in addressing the physical or mental health situation. So Shane, I want to address a couple of the points you made. One of them is with respect to the guilt, one of the reasons we have guilt is because we don't fully understand. We don't necessarily understand the connection and power is knowledge. And the more knowledge you gain, the more insight you gain, uh, the better equipped you were as an individual, the better equipped we all are to deal with some of the challenges life throws at us. The other important point you made was talking about talking to other parents. Um, my experience in dealing with individuals who are caregivers, especially caregivers of those with mental illness, is they think they're alone. They think no one will understand. They think, you know, there are not many people like that. Why am I suffering and everyone else is not? And so having that support group uh, is invaluable to, to understanding that you are not alone, um, <coughs> getting, getting wonderful ideas from other individuals, and just getting that sense of belonging, belonging to, to, to a group, belonging to individuals. Um, you also talked about the exercise. Uh, we know that um, when we are anxious and when we have chronic um, stress, as is standard uh, with caregivers, um, it, it can be very detrimental to our physical health as well, uh, more susceptible to, to issues of illness, more susceptible to emotional issues, uh, very much often a, a lack of sleep, all the, the recipes, so to speak, for increased vulnerability. So we need to be able to, to, to take care of ourselves as well with that. Um, you also mentioned something related to um, the stigma, and you talked about, um, or I, I'm relating it to the stigma, you talked about the medication you took or you are taking for your heart, uh, for your heart disease versus the medication that, that uh, your son is now taking for his schizophrenia. Um, as a practitioner, as a therapist, to me, they, they, are, they are the exact same things. If we're talking about reducing stigma, we wouldn't question for a moment an individual who is a diabetic who needs to be on insulin therapy for the rest of their life, nor should we be questioning or, or, or doubting um, the medication that someone with mental illness uh, needs to take for the rest of their life. It's maintenance, it's, it's understanding that illness is illness. Um, 
And it's also an understanding that, as you pointed out, which is really, really wonderful, that on his medication, he's doing wonderfully well. Um, you know, the, the, the guitarist, the, 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 the two CDs he's recorded, the stability um, in, in, in the home, et cetera. Just, again, highlights that just like with physical illness, when we're receiving treatment, when we're doing what we need to be doing, we can go from that difficult illness stage all the way back to that healthy stage, right? And if we view that, if we view mental illness, we view medication that way, uh, A, it helps a tremendous amount in terms of reducing stigma, but it also helps a, a tremendous amount uh, in terms of the, the guilt, the break that a caregiver can have in the constant worry, et cetera. So some really important points. Um, if I may, I just want to talk quickly about some of the things that, that, that happen just in terms of caregiver stress and the potential for burnout. Um, because we don't want people to get there. And one of the purposes of us talking today is to get uh, you know, the wonderful understanding and insight that you're giving, Shane, but also to be able to talk about what uh, other caregivers might be experiencing um, with respect to their particular caregiving situation. So what are some common signs of caregiver stress, um, anxiety, feeling tired and run down, difficulty sleeping, what I like to call a short refuse, things that didn't bother me will now bother me more because my, my tolerance for difficulty and difficult situations is, 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 is much more sensitive. Um, trouble concentrating, focus and concentration is, is, is often an issue that people who are going through caregiving stress, caregiver stress are experiencing. And it's not because something's wrong with them. It's because where is my focus? It's on that individual that I'm caring for. It's not that I can't remember names or can't remember dates or don't know how to, you know, where my front door is. It's that my focus is very much on that ill family member individual that I'm caring for. Um, and sometimes we too, you know, another, another uh, of many signs of caregiver stress would be, um, though it would be great to be doing things for ourselves, leisure activities, exercise, we cut back on those. We're just overwhelmed, we're tired, et cetera. Um, so if we can get a handle on those, if we can deal with those in terms of our self-care, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, um, we can kind of nip that in the butt and, 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 and deal with those. But sometimes we are very overwhelmed and we can get to the point of caregiver burnout where your energy levels are much lower. Um, you seem to be catching everything. Your anger is increased. You know, anger is a, is a very interesting emotion. Anger often comes from two places. It comes from fear and it comes from frustration. So in this particular case, as a caregiver of someone with mental illness, it's the fear of not understanding. It's the fear of them not getting better. It's the fear of not knowing what's next. And then you couple that, for example, with some of the frustrations of being a caregiver for someone who has mental illness. Um, will they accept my help? Will they want to seek help? And even if they do seek help, you know, if it's an individual over a certain age, then we have issues of confidentiality and discretion. You know, you might be, as a caregiver, doing all the right things, um, setting your child up, your, your family member, or whoever you're caring for, with the right professional. And then what's our natural next question? So tell me how things are going. But because of confidentiality and discretion laws and rules and regulations for, for psychotherapists and psychiatrists and psychologists, et cetera, the answer you might, not, might get back might not be the one that you need to allay some of your fears. So that's uh, you know, another challenge that, we, you know, that you may face. Um, but understand that, that you, know, you should get some comfort from the idea that they're with the right professional. They're getting the help they need. They're getting the support they need. Absolutely. I can relate to a lot of what you said, and I'd like to touch upon uh, some of the things. Self-care, one of the uh, realizations my wife and I came to was that this was going to be a marathon. 
that unlike a, you know, we, we've referenced the broken bone analogy that you take your child to the hospital, the, it's diagnosed, it's treated, they put the cast on, 12 weeks later, hopefully the bone heals and the problem is solved. With my son's situation, as I said, it was a marathon and you literally had to take one day at a time because it was a fluid situation so that the dynamic would change. Sometimes it could even be hour to hour depending on his mental state. So not only were you juggling getting him the medical and mental health treatment that he required, but depending, and a big issue with my son was medication compliance. If that ever faltered, then even if you went through a, an extended period of what we would call success, where he was taking his meds, he appeared to have that insight that he needed to take them, that could change at the drop of a hat. And no one could predict that. So that was an even bigger reason for my wife and I to be very strategic in maintaining our self-care. So, and that's a really important point that you brought up that the caregiver has to be aware that they, they have to maintain their own health because you're not good to the person that you're trying to help if your own health starts to falter. And the other thing that we experienced, and I know in our parental support groups, there was a consistency, is that it's really difficult on a relationship. My wife and I had been married uh, over 20 years when my son first took ill. So it, we, we did have that uh, very strong relationship. We had gone through a number of challenges already losing loved ones to terminal illness, things like that. But we were tested with my son's situation because it's totally unique. You love your children differently than you love other family members. And it's easy in a relationship, even with that love and that long-term uh, loyalty, that you can sometimes turn on each other. You had mentioned earlier, Sam, that, you know, some of the, the burnout for a caregiver is the shorter fuse. And I can definitely state, you know, in my case, and it, it is complicated because you're dealing with so much, I had to work really, really hard on that to recognize that the reason that I, I might be angry it, it's because I had that guilt and uh, I didn't like the fact that my son had changed so drastically, not only physically, but his personality. In a lot of ways, there is that sense of loss that similar to when my father-in-law was uh, suffering through terminal cancer, he had leukemia. There's a, there's a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities. And the only way to get through it, again, is you got to look after yourself. You have to stay mentally and emotionally strong. And another point that you would raise, Sam, which is pivotal, is the need for information and good information. We're very fortunate today that we we have so many great organizations like the uh, Ontario Caregiver Organization. I'm also affiliated with the Schizophrenia Society of Ontario, which will be known as uh, IM on April the 2nd, Innovations in Mental Health. And I utilize both groups to get a lot of the information that I need even to this day. And I would strongly suggest for any caregiver out there, uh, you're gonna require good solid information, especially during the early stages when you're basically, you're, you're not aware of so much because you're thrown into a situation that 
where you are over your head. And even in my situation, going through my brother's uh, life experiences, my son was totally different because, again, he, he's your son. So you, you really feel like you're over your head. And back in 2004, even though there was information on the internet, it was nothing like it is today. So I would strongly suggest to anyone, any caregiver for your own self care to utilize, you know, whether it's the uh, Ontario Caregiver Organization, the IEM, uh, just complete an internet search and, and get that good information, which can really facilitate uh, not only the treatment of the loved one or the friend family member that you're helping, but also your own self care, which you'll find out through your journey is just as pivotal as when you're caring for your loved one. Shane, I'd like to, you know, thank you for some of those suggestions you made specifically the, you know, about taking care of yourself uh, physically and emotionally as well. I want to point out a couple of things that I think would be uh, important for any care caregiver and especially for those caring for individuals with mental illness. Number one, I, I would like to talk about what we call practicing acceptance. As unfair as it is, um, and often the sadness that we have or the difficulty we have in accepting any illness, um, at some point we need to accept it. That for the reality that it is, you know, there is, we have one pathway for emotions, the good and the bad. Um, and if we allow ourselves to experience the worry and the sadness and work through it, because the emotions are there for a reason, then we'll be able to fully experience and accept the joy and the positive aspects and, and the moments of, of wonder that happen in our caregiver journey. So practice acceptance. Uh, number two, embrace your caregiving choice, whether you're there because you had to be, you wanted to be. At some point, as parents, as caregivers, you made a conscious choice to be a caregiver, to take care of your loved one. And it's a wonderful thing that you're doing. Um, and, and it's to be acknowledged um, and, and, and that acceptance is, goes a long way. Um, as a caregiver, you're going to have opportunities to realize that this has changed you, changed you in, in a lot of ways in, in, to a better individual, a more caring, a more sensitive individual. So look at that as, as possibly the silver lining um, and accept that. Um, but as Shane, you said, so, uh, you know, adequately, don't let this caregiving take over your life. Meaning you need to take time for you. You need to acknowledge your needs, your needs, whether it's your own physical needs, your needs within your relationships. Um, and part of acknowledging those needs uh, and dealing with those is not thinking that you have to be in charge of every care and every aspect of the caregiving. Accept help, accept responsibility. Often when I'm dealing with individuals in difficult situations, I will say to them, you have a great support network. Please use it. And their response is, I don't want to bother anyone else. And my question always is, so if someone in your network had a difficulty and came to you for support, what would you do? And the response 100% of the time is, anything I could to help them. So if your attitude is that, imagine the joy and, 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 and the um, want to help that, that other individuals want to give to you. So accept that support, delegate responsibilities from time to time, right? Um, give yourself a break, work on your own relationships, set priorities for things that, and for activities that make your life, you know, happy, that, that rejuvenate you. If we're spending all of our time expending energy, whether it's emotional, physical, um, cognitive, we need to replenish that somewhere. And we replenish it in our relationships. We replenish it in our self-care. And we also, frankly, replenish it for those wonderful positive moments. And they are there if we're looking for them with the individuals that we are caring for. So Shane, whether it's that, that I am sure tremendous amount of joy and pride 
that you get when when your son has you know by producing those two CDs a tremendous accomplishment right by by the moments where you have that connection with the selflessness of your son to know that if he takes his meds, dad's going to take his meds. We're in this together. That's a wonderful bonding, parenting, you know, relationship issue. So there are positive moments, right? So we really need to take care of ourselves that way. Uh, really taking all those moments of self-care because ultimately it's like we say, you know, when you're, when you're on an airplane and before the airplane takes off and they go through the pre-flight instructions the flight attendant says in the event of extreme turbulence if you are traveling with a child in the ex in the event of extreme turbulence the air masks will come down place the air mask over your mouth before your child what does that mean is you know metaphorically it's telling us we need to take care of ourselves because in order to be the best caregiver we can be we need to be the best us the best individual um I'd like to talk a little bit about stigma, but I'm just going to turn it back to you, Shane, because I know you have some uh, life experiences around the whole er um, area of mental health awareness and stigma. So I'm going to let you start off with that and then I'll respond to you. Sure. Um, one of the things I want to touch upon quickly because you had alluded to, um, and then I'll get into the stigma. It's important to realize that even though in our case, my son's situation could have easily taken over our whole life, we still had to go to work. We still had two other children. They were teenagers at the time. And um, to, to deal with besides my son's situation. So that's the, the one point I wanted to make. The rest of your life doesn't stop. And you can't let that stop. Going to work uh, was beneficial in many ways for my wife and myself. It could be challenging at times. And one of the ways that it was challenging is that we could sometimes witness stigma at, at work. So they're, they're, it's like a double-edged sword. Even though there were benefits going to work, um, and other times there were unfortunate realities. But again, by over a period of time, you do become, it's similar to being a battle-hardened soldier, where you have that mental fortitude to ditch the negativity and you fight through it. Because stigma is all-encompassing, even today. It was interesting, in my brother's situation in the 1970s, we could not even talk about it outside the home. And even within our family, I was only 11 years old at the time. When I would ask my parents simple questions like, what's wrong with Eric? What are you going to do to get him better? And I would be shut down almost immediately. And a lot of times the response would be one of hopelessness. My mother really believed there was no one out there who could help my brother. She had a mistrust of the metal, medical system and definitely the mental health system. So her fear was that my brother would be locked up, institutionalized. Everything was negative. When you fast forward uh, to my son's situation 30 years later, I was energized by the what I considered the failures, not only of my parents, but of society, uh, resulting in the loss of my brother. And I was absolutely positive that I was not going to follow in those footsteps. I wasn't going to let stigma or fear prevent me from doing everything in my power to ensure that my son got the treatment he needed. And that included fighting him uh, and his resistance. It included fighting, there's an invisible wall uh, within the, uh, the system itself that you experience initially that is very difficult to overcome. But at the end of the day, the, the one thing I do wanna say, and you touched upon it, Sam, 
is the immense uh, sense of satisfaction and pure joy when your child does realize that stability. So after many years of us struggling, my son ended up getting his grade 12, got his driver's license, he bought a car. These are things that are so important to his not only mental well-being, but his self-esteem. And this was a young man who, during the worst times of his psychosis and psychotic breaks, couldn't even put a sentence together. He couldn't read uh, at all. He couldn't watch TV. And because of the fact that through our efforts and his own and the medication compliance, he was able to attain all of those successes that were huge. And he experienced stigma a lot of times and he, and that resulted in his, a lot of times, lack of insight or the fact that he wanted to, to deny his illness. And one of the cute stories in our experience was after I had my heart attack and no one wants to go through a heart attack, but again, you always have to look at the silver lining. And because I had to take medication on a daily basis, when I came home, my son and I would actually take our medication together. And we had a cute experience where initially he would be asking me about my pills. And he would say, you know, what, what, what is that pill you're taking? And I would tell him, it's a blood thinner. And he would want to know, well, do you have to take that for the rest of your life? And what does it do? And then the next pill would be the cholesterol lowering medication. And he would want to know all of these different things. And I could almost see that there was almost a relief that he had this look of acceptance that dad is no different than me now. He has to take these medications in order to survive. And it was a, a beautiful moment because it just shows what you and I have both mentioned repeatedly. There, there's no difference between a mental illness and a physical illness. And a lot of times when you have either one, you do have to take medication. There shouldn't be any stigma or negativity regarding that. And yet sometimes there is, but we certainly know that there shouldn't be because there are times, whether you have a heart attack, whether you experience a mental illness or you have cancer, you have to take medication and it is not a negative. Thank you very much, Shane. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out with respect to to mental illness and the stigma associated is, as you mentioned, 30 years ago, it was different. We are making tremendous strides now in terms of understanding and educating around mental illness. You, you still do have some of those myths out there, you know, individuals who are mentally ill are lazy or are violent, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in fact, Individuals who are mentally ill are more likely to be the victims of violence than the perpetrators of violence. One of the issues is we still do, when talking about and reporting, especially in the media around mental health, uh, often it's the more uh, extreme or sensational that we're hearing. You're not going to hear if you turn on the radio that there are thousands and thousands of individuals with depression who are going to have a wonderfully productive and happy and healthy day, but that that's our reality. That's the reality. And so, you know, uh, we, we need to stress that. We need to educate individuals. Um, we have biases, we have difficulties, but the more we educate individuals, the more we have initiatives like Let's Talk Bell, and, and, and frankly, the more we have courageous individuals like yourself, Shane, who um, are writing books, who are, are, are out there doing webinars, um, the more it's going to become an understanding and less what we would call the elephant on the wall or the fly in the room, the topic that we don't talk about because knowledge is power. And the more we know, the more we understand that uh, a mental illness is like any illness. If we treat, if we support, and we take care, we can live very healthy, very happy, productive lives. So uh, again, um, 
as you and I have talked a number of times, um, to be able to talk about this um, and to be able to deal with mental illness, um, either as the individual who is suffering or the caregiver supporting it, um, frankly, is, is a, a true act of courage. Um, and and um, so blessed that we have individuals like you who are willing to come forward and talk about this because this is what's going to make a difference to individuals um, understanding of mental illness, but also to those people who have taken this step and the responsibility to be caregivers. It, it makes a world of difference. Absolutely. And I, I would just add, even though obviously my wife and I would never have chosen my son to have to go through the uh, situation he has and continues to go through, there have been so many positives, as I mentioned earlier, um, just to see him realize a stability that has been phenomenal. I know at the, the worst times of his illness, and this is really important to remember from a caregiver's perspective, that you, you can't get too high or too low, because at the worst times, you feel that it's never going to end. And, and you can't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. But there are going to be those triumphs. And you have to be patient. You have to, as, as we've said a couple or a number of times, you have to uh, look at your own self-care and, and fight through the negativity and don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed. And then you will realize triumphs. And over time, it's the triumphs can be very small, but you're looking for any positivity and you accept it. When you have a good day, then you acknowledge that. And then with the realization that there's going to be days when they're not so good. And that doesn't mean that you've lost anything or everything. You just simply accept it for what it is, that it is a marathon. And that helps you over time. As human beings, we do learn from experience and we get stronger when we go through those times. And over a period, we see the ups and downs and we don't allow ourselves to get too high or too low. Uh, and it's not that you become desensitized, but it's almost what I would call a, a strategic mindset that you realize over time, you have to maintain your positivity as a caregiver and you have to incorporate strategic measures. As we've mentioned, exercise, not doing anything that's going to, you know, whether it's drinking too much, using drugs, if that causes you to weaken or to lose your resolve, then you have to be aware of that. And yet you have to monitor and take the appropriate steps to make sure that you're as strong as you need to be in order to be the best caregiver that you can be. Wonderful. Thank you, Shane and Sam, for the inspiring and invigorating talk. 